The Fairy Fulmer was a naval fighter and reconnaissance aircraft which saw service during the Second World War. Having a requirement for a crew of two, due to the belief that a navigator was used for operations at sea, this resulted in a larger design compared to contemporary land-based fighter aircraft. Whilst not the pinnacle of naval fighters, and would be surpassed by the improved Fairy Firefly, the former would see much use and participate in many major battles of the Second World War. Hello everyone and welcome back to the workbench. Matt from Model Minutes here and in today's video I'm building and reviewing the 172nd scale Fairy Farmer plastic model kit from Mistercraft. And to be honest, it might be one of the best kits this manufacturer has had in their range. So join me as I explore the construction of this kit and find out why this is one of the better Mistercraft models. This video will focus on what the build of this model is like, so for a more detailed look at the sprues and other contents of the box, take a look at the unboxing I've already made on that topic. I'll pop a list of the products I used during this build on the screen now, to give you an idea of the kinds of paints you might need in case you want to do one of these for yourself. Before I get into the build though, please remember that model construction can be hazardous due to the use of sharp tools and toxic paints and chemicals. The kit didn't feel particularly greasy, so I neglected washing the parts and instead decided to crack straight on with the build. I used my cutters to remove the parts from the sprue and then cleaned up any flash or rough areas with a nail file. Revell contactor cement was used to glue the very sparse cockpit details into place on the cockpit floor. These only consist of chairs, rudder pedals and a control column. Sadly, no crew figures are included in this model. There was a little flash in a few places, so this was carefully removed with a knife, particularly on the nose of the fuselage halves. The cockpit assembly was then cemented into place in one of the fuselage halves, with the remaining detail parts being glued on as well. These details were the bulkhead and pilot's chair. There is a control panel with some simple details molded on though, and this was glued into place as well. Now, to paint the internal areas of the aircraft, I'm going to use this Hataka interior grey-green acrylic paint, which comes airbrush ready. As a result, it was loaded into my airbrush and a few light coats of this paint applied to these parts. You'll note that some other parts, like the landing gear covers and internal gear bay areas, are also receiving this paint at this point. Tamiya Extra Thin Cement was now used to bond the upper and lower wing surfaces together. This glue works well to run into the joins and gaps to ensure a good bond between the components. It has been noted by other modellers that this model has a fit issue at the wing root, and that's due to this small amount of plastic which sticks out from the wing halves. It's only a tiny amount of plastic, but if you remove it with a sharp knife, it should pretty much solve the problem. Vallejo Black was used to paint the control panel and top of the control column in the cockpit. Vallejo Silver was then painted into the air intake on the lower side of the fuselage halves. Humble 62 Leather was carefully applied to the pilot's headrest and the observer's seat. I then glued this part which houses the arrestor hook into place on the bottom of the fuselage. And now the two fuselage halves can be cemented together. This was followed by joining them to the wings. I had to take care here to get everything lined up correctly. The fit though is generally not too bad. There is still a small gap at the wing roots though, but with that small bit of plastic having been removed earlier, it means that I can add a little more cement, apply some pressure and close it up. When the cement had cured, some fine grit sandpaper was run along all the joints to tidy them up and make them look a bit neater. I did have to use a little humble model filler to close up a small gap in the landing gear bay areas though. This was a result of removing that little plastic earlier. Whilst it mostly fixed the issue with the gap at the wing root, it did leave a small one here, so a little filler was used to conceal it. I did feel that the wing root on the starboard side wasn't quite perfect, so a little filler was used here to make that a little less obvious as well. In the cockpit area, a little paint was scraped away so that I could cement this second bulkhead into place. This was then followed by using some Humbrol Clear Fix to glue the reflector gun sight into place, and then I moved on to glue the tail surfaces into their slots at the back of the plane and the extra air intakes on the nose of the model. The cockpit canopy comes as a single part, and I used my normal method to mask this, which is to cut some strips of masking tape, 
Press them down and then carefully cut the tape using the window frames as a guide. Given that this aircraft has quite a lot of canopy, this was a rather time consuming stage, but I think it was well worth the effort if done correctly. Some more clear fix was used to glue the canopy into place and then when it was secure, I placed the landing gear covers into their slots on the bottom of the model. These are not glued in though, simply acting as masks for these areas as I will remove them later. Now it's time to start painting the model. Working from light to dark, I started with this Hataka medium sea grey and sprayed it onto the lower surfaces of the model. This might be a controversial choice, as on the instructions it looks like it should be a sky type S colour, but as can be seen in the callouts, the lower surfaces are labelled with a C, indicating that this should be the grey colour I've used. This is a little confusing on the instructions part, and whilst my research indicates that sky colour was used on Falmers, the grey would seem to be a more appropriate one for an aircraft used during Operation Torch, but I'm still not entirely sure which is correct. So for now I'm going to trust the instructions and do as I'm told. When the grey was dry I masked the lower surfaces with tape, and then painted the upper areas of the plane with Tamiya Dark Grey, which I thinned down with some Tamiya X20 acrylic thinner in my airbrush. I didn't have much experience airbrushing Tamiya acrylics until now, and I have to say that I was pleasantly impressed with the smooth results these paints provide. When that paint was dry, I made some worms out of sticky tack, and then applied them to the model in a camouflage pattern. Vallejo Liquid Mask was then painted onto the areas of the camo scheme that I wanted to protect and then left to dry. Tamiya Dark Green was then thinned as before and loaded into my airbrush, being sprayed onto the upper surfaces in the unprotected areas of the camouflage pattern. When that was done, I carefully removed the masks to reveal the camouflage pattern and it seems to have come out pretty well. This airbrush ready K colours gloss varnish is now sprayed onto the entire model to help create a nice smooth surface in preparation for applying the decals. And speaking of the decals, they are generally okay, but will need a little care to apply them. I cut the sheet into more manageable pieces, identifying the ones I needed for my particular paint scheme. Mr. Craft decals are well known for disintegrating though. So to prevent this, I applied some microscale liquid decal film to the transfers before going any further. This should help stop them falling apart as I apply them to the model. I then soaked the transfers in warm water to release them from the backing paper. And microscale microset was brushed onto the relevant areas of the model. The decals were then carefully slid into place and then the position fine tuned. Application of the transfers was relatively straightforward, but I did experience a little disintegration in a few places, which with some care and patience I was able to overcome. I'm glad I used the microscale liquid film earlier, because this would have been much worse otherwise. When the decals were in place, microscale microsol was applied on the top to further melt the transfers into the surface details and make them look as though they were painted on. Some of the decals did curl up a little and I thought I would try something a little more aggressive, so for these I used Humbrol Decal Fix, which, with a few applications, managed to get these stubborn decals to settle down. With those decals now in place, to protect them and seal them into the model, the K-Colors Gloss Varnish made a reappearance and was sprayed onto the entire model. With that now dry, Vallejo Model Air Red was brushed onto the gun ports on the wings, a number of layers would be needed to build up a solid colour. Next, this Vallejo Umber Wash was applied to the panel lines on the model to help bring them out a little more. I then removed the wash very carefully with a sponge and a tiny amount of acrylic thinner on it. I was super careful not to remove the previous acrylic paint layers and ruin the finish. When that was dry, Vallejo Matte Varnish was thinned with a little water in the airbrush and then sprayed over the entire model to dull down the previous gloss finish and make the model look a little more uniform. Now for the propeller. This was assembled as per the instructions, with the spinner being glued onto the front, the axle passing through its mount and then secured with the retaining piece at the end. If done right, it should be able to rotate. This, along with the wheels and engine exhaust, were then sprayed with Vallejo Black. Vallejo Aluminium was carefully painted onto the wheel centres, the landing gear legs, 
the arrestor hook and the pitot tube. Tamiya bronze was mixed in with some of this aluminium paint and then applied to the engine exhausts to give a more burnt metal appearance. Now, I glue the landing gear legs into their holes in the bottom of the model and the wheels could then be cemented onto their axles. The tail wheel was glued into the hole on the bottom of the tail. The arrestor hook was glued into its groove in the bottom of the fuselage. The pitot tube found its way into the hole in the bottom of the wing. The landing gear covers need to be cut so that they can be added to the model correctly and these were then glued into the relevant places on the model. Tamiya yellow was carefully painted onto the tips of the propeller blades. The engine exhausts were then added to the model and then the propeller assembly was cemented into place on the nose. The tape on the canopy was carefully peeled away and when that was done it was time for a few finishing touches. The Vallejo aluminium was used to simulate some chipping of the paintwork in various places on the model. I simply used the fine point of a brush to do this. Next up I removed some dust from a black pastel and then this was applied to the areas where smoke stains could be present, particularly around the gun ports and engine exhausts. Finally some Ushi fine rigging elastic thread was super glued onto the tail, then stretched to the aerial mast. After the glue had dried, the excess thread was cut away. And that's it. That's as far as I went with my build of the Mr. Craft Fairy Foamer in 172nd scale. Before I round off this video with a review though, it's time to hear a little about the history of the actual Foamer from a long time community member, Noodle. The Foamer was a twin seat, single engine carrier bomb reconnaissance fighter aircraft manufactured by Fairy Aviation. It began production and was first flown in January 1940 and was eventually introduced to the fleet air arm just five months later. The design was based on that of the early Ferry P-4, however it was redesigned as a naval operated aircraft so it could satisfy the requirements needed for the British Air Ministry. It also inherited its name from the Northern Fulmar, a seaborne bird native to the British Isles. Much like its predecessors, its performance was subpar, however it was reliable and sturdy and it had the potential to fly much longer than other similar aircraft and also carried a substantial amount of wing-mounted machine guns. The aircraft was also very easy to manufacture. The Fulmar first saw service in July 1940, where it became a participant in the reconnaissance and sinking of the Bismarck. It was also greatly utilised in the North Africa campaign, being used as a convoy protection aircraft and also helped escort the furry swordfish in conflicts such as the Battle of Taranto, a battle of the British and Italian naval forces. After just a few months, short of a year of service, the Fulmar proved itself as a capable escort and reconnaissance aircraft and had also managed to down 10 bombers and 6 fighters. The Fulmar was then deployed in the Far East during 1941 and 1942, however was incapable of matching the performance of its Japanese rival fighters, so was eventually relegated in favour of the newly built Supermarine Seafire and its American counterparts. The full mile project came to a close in 1942 and its production ceased, leaving only 600 airframes. It continued service as a maritime trainer aircraft and was withdrawn from service as the war ended in 1945. I would like to thank Matt and Model Minutes for letting me create this segment. I very much enjoyed it and as you can tell I have been very enthusiastic about it. I shall now pass over the microphone back to Matt and let him finish showing this amazing aircraft. So, see you next time. A massive thanks for Noodle for that history segment and to Ollie5050 for the footage, but now on to the review. So whilst I said at the beginning of the video that this is probably one of the best kits that Mr. Craft has produced in recent years, I'm sure that you'll have been able to notice during the build that it was far from having only a couple of issues. So first off, let's talk about the history of this kit. The tooling of this model dates back to 1994 when it was first part of the Vista range. Since then it's been passed between various manufacturers over the years with even Ravel and Airfix reboxing it at one point or another. The Mr. Craft version I have here dates from 2015 and featured a number of different decal schemes and the slightly misleading or confusing instructions that they created to go with it. 
The tooling is generally not too bad, with recessed panel lines and other details, and results in a relatively good representation of the real former. However, given its age, it does suffer from a few areas where the fit is poor and there is excess flash that needs cleaning up. I found the cockpit details to be a bit lacking, and the omission of crew figures is another disappointment. Generally though, the build is relatively straightforward, with only a few areas that could present a small challenge, such as having to fill a few gaps here and there. The instructions do leave a little bit to be desired though, being a bit misleading with the colour callouts, but with a little extra research online it is possible to overcome these problems. The decals could break this kit though, being thin and papery, prone to disintegrating and generally being a little poor in the print quality. Having prepared the decals with the decal fluid beforehand, I was able to avoid the complete destruction of these transfers during the application process. As for my completion of this kit, in all honesty, I built this nearly two years ago now as part of a group build on my Discord server, and at the time it did test my skills somewhat, seeing as I was quite new to using an airbrush and was still experimenting with some weathering techniques. I'm really pleased with the way this looks and in my own opinion I think it was a bit of a turning point in the quality of my builds and the development of my skills. So would I build this kit again? Yeah, I think I probably would. It does present a few challenges which can be overcome with a little care and retailing for around £5 or so here in the UK is not exactly an expensive kit to buy. I'd like to thank the guys who contributed to the video today and also to my Patreons and channel members for the extra support they give the channel. Take a look at the link in the description to find out more about how you can get involved. If you enjoyed this one, dropping a like under the video would be greatly appreciated and leaving a comment with your thoughts on this build would be great to read too. If you're new here and would like to see more content like this, make sure you subscribe with notifications on so you never miss a modelling upload. Finally, the last thing to say is a massive thank you to you for watching this one and I'll see you on the workbench again next time.